please uh, take a seat at the table. So now I give floor to Carlis, who will ask all the panel participants and will lead the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Daiga. Uh, thank you, Waldo, for this very interesting presentation. And I just would like to invite other participants. I see in the room our hope, our good minister, Minister of Transport, who is very supportive for, for this uh, topic, who uh, immediately, uh, thank you, Minister, joined uh, to this idea to participate here. Actually, uh, Minister of Transport is, is actually one of the biggest holders of state-owned companies, because in Latvia, if you don't know, still the state-owned enterprises are split. Yeah. As a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a minister, uh, so the ministries are managing uh, state companies. Yeah? We have not centralized, I hope we will do it uh, in the future, but uh, till now it's under ministries, uh, so the Ministry of Transport uh, manages uh, important companies. So, and uh, I would like to invite uh, Petris Stepinch from Swedbank. Uh, Swedbank is a large bank here in the Baltics and actually largest uh, manager of pension money. 1.7 billion uh, euros in Latvia are managed of so-called second and third pillar of pension money. So the rich guy managing billions. So I would like to uh, invite uh, our boss here. This is here, hall, here, house, Reynis uh, Berzinch from Altum. Uh, Altum is a state-owned development bank, actually, which supports a lot of uh, different uh, initiatives. And uh, actually, Reynis uh, is a manager who managed to issue a bonds, 30 million bonds. Uh, so, uh, can uh, share this view and is a good example of Latvian state-owned institutions or companies which are doing uh, actually good things in, in capital markets. Uh, I would like to invite Rafael Shepanyak from Global UBS Bank uh, Investment Bank, who is the head of emerging and European uh, markets here. With a lot of experience he has seen uh, in a region. I hope he will uh, tell you and me uh, his things about, let's say, where we as the Baltics are seen from the global perspective and uh, what we can do better. And who else? Yeah, please. Biggest investor, as we have heard, uh, Iberdi, Mr. Takac, so who already uh, 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 explained a lot of experience in this more than 25 years here in the region uh, of, of European uh, Bank here. And as the minister joined uh, to this um, event a little bit uh, uh, later, I will just give, of course, first... Uh, opportunity to, to talk to, to the minister. So thank you, minister, again, that you, uh, you are brave enough, that you are here, that you are supporting this idea of, 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 of uh, listed, uh, listing and, and this. Then, please, floor is yours. Yes, hello, everyone. I am very glad to be here today and, and feel like, like uh, among friends uh, because uh, for quite many years I've been involved in the privatization of uh, state-owned companies and later in the management uh, positions and also myself uh, owning a few shares in some listed companies. I, I, I understand also the position of minority shareholders. And, and now uh, three months, for three months already, uh, in the position of the Minister of Transport, I, I'm trying to grasp uh, how to manage all these large uh, state-owned uh, entities. And uh, certainly there are many issues related to, to the ownership and, and uh, to the performance of the companies. First of all, it's a governance, good governance, what we have to ensure in, in state-owned companies, first of all, even before we, we start thinking about uh, uh, going private. Then it's the issue of, uh, of the, where, where do we place ownership uh, in, in the 
whole structure of the government. Who are the real owners, who are the state agents responsible for governing these uh, state-owned companies? And uh, honestly, during these three months in office, uh, for many times I have felt conflict of interest when, when on the one side I had to speak about uh, liberalization of the market uh, in railway sector, in road maintenance sector, uh, in, in other cases, and uh, still uh, we have uh, state-owned companies uh, there and, and then uh, being asked to, about the profit and the dividend policy and, and so on, how, how this liberalization would, would uh, impact the performance of, uh, of state-owned companies. So, therefore, not only my preference, but, but also what I, we have been discussed in, among the government members, the preference is to, to have a centralized uh, owner of, of state-owned companies as, as soon as possible uh, established and, uh, and uh, well performing I, I would with pleasure any any next day uh, give away Latvian railways to the, such uh, such uh, uh, centralized uh, owner uh, in order to make sure that the, the sector as such and that the quality of performance of of different actors in in the sector is is uh, up to the standards um, also, we have to speak about the uh, liberalization of, of several sectors uh, in the transport field, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, we already have uh, uh, quite uh, open uh, railway sector where different uh, operators, cargo operators uh, uh, are in place, but also in the passenger uh, uh, carriage the, uh, theoretically from the 1st of January there is opportunity for everyone to, to step in and compete with, with our local state owned uh, uh, passenger uh, company uh, we are also uh, pledged in the government declaration that we will open up uh, road maintenance sector. We will uh, change the principles of, of the public transportation uh, sector in a few years. So all these activities will have consequences uh, on, on the state-owned companies in, in operating in these fields and, and possi possibility to, to look at the ownership uh, uh, change. And then um, what is left is uh, preparation for private ownership. And here we uh, should start from the governance side, from the uh, very clear strategy of, of the company, um, where do we want to be in, in 5, 10, even 20 years? What, what investments are needed? What, what other uh, regulatory um, laws are needed in order to ensure that when the company is uh, private, uh, we ensure fair competition and we do not create monopolies, uh, private monopoly in one or another sector? And at the end, uh, in order to sell the shares of the company successfully, we need success story. This is uh, uh, what I envy, the port of Tallinn, there is this success story, um, which is actually supported by, by so many travelers. The, the number of passengers, and I believe every Estonian has tried the port of Tallinn and, and uh, at least quite large part of Latvians as well. So they have tested this, uh, this company, the performance of company, and they believe in, in success uh, of this, this story, not only in the past, but also in the future. And from that perspective, I, I think when I, when I look at uh, the per portfolio of uh, companies under the Ministry of Transport, uh, then um, 
probably Air Baltic would be one such example which we are prepared to offer uh, to, to other, uh, other investors. We are interested in uh, attracting not only strategic investors but also uh, through IPO process additional uh, funding. Uh, I think this is the case where uh, the company is well known not only in, in Latvia or in the Baltics, but, but uh, because of uh, their performance, because of uh, acquiring new aircraft, they are uh, quite uh, visible also in the international aviation market uh, all around the world. So this, this is, is one very quick example when we are talking about uh, attracting private investors. Others, I think, still have some time for the preparation, for opening up the sector, for, for uh, management, for the governance, and these issues what I mentioned. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, yeah, so that's, I think, really good that Minister is supporting this, uh, this idea, and, and really, our Baltic is, uh, I know it quite well. Uh, so, as a company, so, ready for that. The question is more about markets, uh, uh, business development and so on, so practical things. So the company is acting as private company for, for a very long time already. But let me maybe ask you this uh, uh, question, I think, which uh, I believe is important. Strategic and public. I think somehow in Latvia have that those things are not somehow living together. If the asset somehow is strategic, then hands off. This is something, I don't know, very, 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 very important. Nobody really explains why and what it doesn't mean. And actually, how do you see a company might be strategic and listed at the same uh, time? What do you think? My, my personal opinion, there are no secret cows uh, specifically devoted for, for keeping them uh, for 100% for state ownership if there is a reason behind uh, going public. Um, I think that what, what we have to avoid is creating uh, private monopolies. And first we have to look at particular sectors where, where these companies are operating. If uh, this, this is something where, where there is already competition or we are opening up the sector, then, then it's uh, more, uh, more acceptable also to general public. Uh, I think uh, some 10 years ago it would be unbelievable to think of, for example, Latvenergo being uh, uh, listed somewhere. I, I remember the fights uh, in in a parliament long time ago about secret uh, secret uh, river Daugava and and how how we can sell our mother river and and, and all these uh, stories. Yeah, the, there was the in, intention to organize a referendum on on the issue, and uh, uh, now uh, when I think every uh, user or, or receiver of electricity understand that there is a competition among uh, suppliers and this sector is really uh, uh, competitive with, with, several, uh, uh, with several large players. I think in, in this perspective now it's there is a more chance to persuade general public yeah this is only one of few companies and and why not be listed yeah yeah good point i share fully with minister this this really a lot of is already partially listed with the bonds so the company is actually one of the most valuable companies in latvia for a long time and and why not so that's that's very logical May, so do, may yeah. I add, yes, uh, in, in our case, in, in Port of Tallinn, I guess that's very important for the government uh, defined what, what means this uh, strategic asset. And with uh, Port of Tallinn, they defined that they never uh, sell uh, um, more than 39%. Uh, 
first stage now maybe that's not the issue to sell just now more but never they go below 51 to keep just control because of strategical infrastructure we serve NATO ships and these kind of things, you understand. And, and uh, with other uh, companies, I guess it's, it's uh, basically doable with, with all the, all the state-owned companies. Therefore, there is another list uh, for now four or five uh, companies that are on a list, and, and it's, how to say, doable to, to define this strategic interest. Yeah. Uh, Waldo, do you feel right now less strategic being on the stock no, exchange. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I mean, not you, but your company. <laughs> no, no. No difference. Uh, of course, that was a little provocative question, so thank, thank you for that. But I, I think that's a, that's a, a good point, uh, that uh, somehow this uh, strategic importance is just to use to do nothing. Yeah? So from some of politicians, and unfortunately, that that's, that's was in the history. I hope that will change, and as a minister right now is here, that is uh, one of the examples that things are changing. Uh, let's maybe then uh, jump to, to, let's say, a good example to Rainis, yeah, who is like this good uh, example with uh, Altum being on stock exchange, doing things uh, differently maybe from other state-owned enterprises. Uh, Rainis, what, is, what was the main challenge for you to talk with your actually three shareholders, three ministers, or, or prepare your company, or or to talk to his investors, what was the main challenges in this process? Yeah, so if you would consider was it easy or not, I would like to say that perhaps both uh, yes and no. Uh, at the very beginning, you also mentioned the conversations about uh, with the shareholders. Uh, those were quite easy conversations because when the Autumn was founded back uh, four years ago, uh, there was also content for this management board, and I went there and uh, through this competition, and also said that if I will go to the Altman, if we will be, uh, if I will be CEO, this will be one of my main proposals, just to actually to get uh, issuing the bonds to be more uh, independent from the EU funds, from the state treasury, uh, similar like also other very good um, institutions uh, in Western Europe, for example, also. Uh, Finvera, which is a similar organization uh, up here in uh, Finland. So actually we had that support from shareholders, su from supervisory council from the very beginning, also from my colleagues from the management board, they are also present here, and I guess uh, we created uh, a team. Uh, so that was the easiest part. Um, the hardest part was actually also that we did some hard exercise. We considered that it will be totally new program, so uh, there will be not a single euro uh, attracted from different resources, just from this bond issuing, so it was quite a challenge. Uh, we also designed that. We said that uh, those will be green bonds, because the program was uh, connected with the uh, green ideas, uh, green support for uh, companies. So a lot of challenges. We said that we, we will go through the rating system. Uh, we got the Moody's rating. And actually now I can just name those things in a couple of minutes, but when you go through, I remember uh, 2017, that was quite a year and that was actually the project number one. So big team there and uh, for me, myself, it was like, I don't know, some 30, 35 meetings just for this issue during the year, right? So I had a great team, as I said, from the management board and also Elin, who is present here, she was also like managing this process in excellent way. So um, it went easier when we got this first bond issue because it was success story. We got a great coupon, 1.3. We had, uh, there was an, um, uh, seven times bigger interest than we actually wanted. We said that it's enough with 20 million euros. Demand was around 135 million euros. So when, the, when, this, uh, when we went through this procedure, then the second already, it was quite easy. Although it happened actually last year in the March, you remember what happened in February last year, right? In financial sector, there were several uh, things which happened and we just uh, thought, okay, what, we'll, what we will do with our uh, you know, issuing of bond, which was planned in the, back in March 2018, but nothing happened. You know, the famous <laughs> sentence, but really nothing happened. 
um, because uh, it was a great coupon again, the same 1.3, great interest again, six times more. So Moody's uh, stayed with the same rating, so it was a success story, and we will look for, We are now looking forward for upcoming years to issue again bonds uh, for several times more for upcoming three years in amount of 70 million euros. So totally it will be 100 million euros, so we feel uh, free with that. Yeah, see, Uranus is very active in and, and, and issuing bonds and continuing the, to do that. So that's really great uh, to hear, so, because, yeah, so, well, well, in terms of management, you mentioned your team and team is present here. What maybe is the changes uh, uh, in the management mindset before you actually went to the public market and after that? Do you feel some, or do you tell some differences are there or not? Of course, honestly speaking, of course, everyone understands those great words, corporate governance, being transparent, open up and so on, but when it really happens, then also in, in our office there were some ideas why we should do that. We have like, I don't know, quarterly reports to our supervisory council, why we should do more, why we have to, you know, just uh, being so open, right? But it actually it helped also when the Moody's came here and when the Moody's asked the questions, you really understand that you have to open everything, literally everything. You have to be transparent as it possible. So it actually, when we got this Moody's experience, then it was also any experience afterwards with the stock exchange, it was already quite good. So your life is, let's say, not so easy, but more interesting as a CEO of listed uh, entity after that, yeah? It was like interesting, I know it's again only a good thing because uh, as we say the second time it was really very easy when you do the first thing and I also understand I don't know how many pages we had, definitely like not 300 but a lot of them right when we did the first exercise it was really a lot of the paperwork but afterwards when you have everything that um, it was you cannot compare the first and the, any other time. Yeah, oh, yeah well maybe I will ask you uh, uh, as well. In terms of management motivation, uh, as I understand from you, before the uh, listing, anyway, the company was acting as private, uh, being 100% owned, but anyway, as, 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 as private business. But anyway, do you have introduced them stock options or other, let's say, motivation, bonuses, or, 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 or in terms of management compensation, there were no significant changes after uh, IPO? Yeah, we decided together with the main owner <laughs> or with, the, uh, with our uh, ministry that uh, we are not going to introduce stock uh, options in the first stage. Uh, and, uh, and now we uh, opened this negotiation again. We just decided not to do it uh, at the IPO, during the IPO. And we have such a common incentive plan, uh, what is typical balance scorecard, but it's quite precise. There are main targets and then sub-targets, and that's applied for 120 key persons. And they uh, getting then uh, uh, free four months uh, salary additionally if it's uh, executed. But it's very precise, a classical balance scorecard. But yeah, we, we think about the stock options because of very difficult situation uh, on a labor market. And I guess same here. You have to keep your specialists. That's not uh, only the management board, but uh, all the key persons. Because at least in Latvia, there is many, many reports analysis done by, by Fontes, for example, and other uh, HR companies that there is a huge difference between state-owned like enterprises and, and, uh, and uh, salary level and private companies, at least in Latvia. And of course, this is big problem because on one hand, of course, there should be special rules for state-owned companies and so on, but there are some, my, my, in my opinion, some social, social style limits which purely limits, let's say, some standard motivation system to be in the place in, in, in companies which are actually competing with private companies. And this is like some Soviet Soviet uh, heritage that still we have, and and I hope is this uh, listing, for example, this is one way how to solve it. You're right. We have the same problem. There is a difference between private and and uh, st state-owned companies, but the the difference is is nowadays a little bit smaller already. Yeah, and and but still it is. But uh, we we saying in a company that uh, money is uh, not most important thing in a life. And. Um, and that is uh, uh, there are other other motivations. <laughs> yeah, 
And that's, uh, you should love your work, I think you should be happy with that. And so that's, of course, is more broader, broader uh, uh, tema, but not maybe, maybe today, but sure. Um, then I will ask to join uh, to our uh, discussion, Liri Glo Global View and Player, uh, Raphael. You know a lot, you have seen a lot, you are traveling a lot. You, you have seen and ha have discussed, I think, these kind of discussions a lot and a lot. What are your, let's say, main uh, like uh, words, what you can say here to people about uh, Baltic markets and those issues and potential that we are discussing here? What, what as an outsider but insider at the same time, what you can say? Maybe just two words about myself, because uh, you may be wondering what this banker is doing here. Um, uh, I am Polish, so I'm almost a neighbor. Um, I grew up in China, I went to schools in America, and I've been working for the past, I think, 18 years or 19 years, um, mostly initially for 10 years at, at Goldman, and then for five years at BAMO at Merrill Lynch, which uh, in the meantime became Bank of America Merrill Lynch, and then in the last two years um, at UBS. Um, I did have a stint at EBRD, and I think that lasted nine months or so, and this is one of the most um, enriching and eye-opening experiences ever for a young aspiring banker, and these relationships are being continued now uh, in, um, in my current experience because uh, I cannot imagine in the last 15 years or so any single transaction situation project in Central Eastern Europe without some kind of participation of EBRD in some kind of form or shape. EBRD, after all, um, is the largest lender to the real economy in this region. Uh, it is the largest LP, limited partner. It is a large fund of funds um, invested, I think, currently in more than 200 different um, private equity funds. Uh, it is also the largest foreign direct investor in a lot of these economies. So when we come to a situation, EBRD is already there as a lender and in some situation as, a, uh, as an existing shareholder. Um, I started being a, a completely unaware little kid sitting in my cubicle in New York when we got a call that um, Goldman won a privatization mandate uh, to sell uh, Czech Republic's second largest bank, commercial bank, that was way back in, in the year 2000, um, uh, before the uh, internet um, bubble bursted and before uh, September 11. So I was shipped to Praha, uh, uh, being a financial institution uh, banker, uh, we call it FIG in our jargon, and I used to be this um, uh, introvert um, uh, geek sitting in a cubicle and cracking financial model because that's what I was trained to do. And I had to interact with the Czech government at that point. Um, they didn't have a centralized agency. This is something that the theme which came up today. Um, and I think that this is a very kind of valid point which we can evaluate later. Uh, but state stakes used to be held in different agencies, not just different ministries, but in the case of, for instance, banks, uh, it, was, uh, it was held under the National Bank, so basically the Central Bank of the, of the Czech Republic. Um, and I remember that uh, this was a very kind of uh, convoluted story because uh, there was a lot of contingent liabilities about preparing state-owned enterprises for privatization, uh, where we were debating whether to spin off the bad bank or sell one big commercial banker with the bad bank sitting inside, but with um, the government pledging that you know they will take care and they will issue some guarantees for the for the liabilities, so that you you sell the bank intact, but the incoming foreign investors doesn't have to worry um, about the uh, consequences of um, of that of those liabilities. Um, they did not um, at that point want to follow the Polish model of. Um, pushing as many stocks into the Warsaw Stock Exchange as possible because the bank was so mismanaged, they needed know-how and they needed capital now. Um, so uh, we were involved for months before the actual tender was announced that, um, hey, come over here to the Czech Republic and submit your non-binding bids because we needed to find the management. We needed to find um, uh, English-speaking Czechs 
Uh, so we brought one from Austria, we brought another one uh, from California. Um, that's another digression, very interesting uh, feature. Um, you guys from the Baltics and Poles somehow ended up in cold Chicago, where the Czechs, a landlocked country, uh, they congregate outside of San Francisco. It was a, a phenomenon for me, uh, going for the better climate and the sea access. Um, but. Um, uh, the guy who was brought became the CFO, the guy from Austria became the CEO because we needed to have um, uh, people with experience but also who could communicate with those investors. Um, so maybe that's one of the reasons why I ended up at this table because early on I had experience, I think that 50% of my work was basically done throughout my career with state-owned enterprises. Then privatizations and, and the sales of Ukrainian banks, uh, all the major um, uh, stock all the major flotations listings of the Polish company, whether it's uh, PZU or the uh, Central Eastern Europe lar largest bank, PKO, or the Warsaw Stock Exchange to be listed on its own um, a platform, uh, or Tower on the energy company. I've participated in all of them in different roles, um, Ed Goldman and Ed Merrill, and then most recently um, uh, when Romania opened up, um, it did open up because it had to because the IMF struck a deal back in 2009 that we were going to lend you money in 2009, but there are certain preconditions. And one of them is that you need to privatize your energy sector. Otherwise, probably you would not be seeing all these companies like Romgas, Electrica, Transgas, Transelectrica coming to the stock exchange. Um, NLB is a good example used by Pavo just a moment ago and the case study, but please do not forget that the bank was capitalized in the midst of the crisis and there was an agreement with the European Commission uh, that by the end of this year, 75% um, um, plus one share uh, needs to end up on the stock exchange. Otherwise, I don't know whether there would be a willingness of that allegedly very open-minded uh, small economy called Slovenia to, um, uh, to privatize um, um, uh, the largest financial institution in Southern Eastern Europe, which is present, I think, in six or seven other countries. Um, so there are different motivations. There was a question earlier, strategic and non-strategic. I think we need to be very careful, um, and, and I'm representing kind of advisory investment banking community here, um, but I'm also very aware of the, of the years which I spent in China, that there are certain companies, and look at water utility companies, whether it's Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia, which uh, keep connecting thousands and thousands of people, citizens, for free. No other company would even consider that, right, in Western Europe, in Western world, because we don't even think about it. So um, I understand that... Uh, sorry, in Riga, one traffic company here in Riga that is operating in this style, yeah. You, um, uh, swiftly moving on, um, in, uh, I think that the gov government officials need to think very carefully whether these are some um, geopolitical motivations, whether some social motivations, whether, you know, they, I think that it's very challenging these days to be a state-owned enterprise in the European Union. There is so much scrutiny uh, not just by the investor community and by, by media, including social media. Um, I think that um, everybody um, believes that the state-owned companies in those countries need to be some kind of role models in terms of gender equality and a lot of other things, right? They need to be very careful how they deal with the environmental issue and things like that, because otherwise everything is out in the open and everybody is, um, 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 has an opinion, right, about state-owned enterprises. Um, um, I think that one of the key takeaways, because um, uh, it came up in a number of presentations, but also um, uh, in, in this forum here in our panel, um, just like the B word um, is a taboo word uh, when we talk about the UK, when I go and see clients you mean Brexit, and nobody yeah. wants to mention this word, um, uh, just the P word uh, for privatization is some kind of weird, um, I think that we all have bad n connotations with this word, with e except maybe, maybe, to a certain extent, uh, Poland. Um, uh, and I'm not saying this because I'm coming from Poland, but um, I think that we are all kind of damaged. And, and I can say that because I'm one of you, I'm from the region as well. Um, I think that what we saw um, um, uh, not all of you may remember these things, but um, I think in privatization, which happened in a very kind of haphazard way uh, two decades ago, 
um, in different forms in our countries, whether that was a voucher privatization, uh, where um, uh, with all due respect to babushkas, but when they received those certificates and they didn't know what to do with them, but somebody else who was a little bit smarter offered them some cash for that certificate here and today for which that babushka, uh, the proverbial um, um, uh, regular citizen could buy bread and butter and milk, uh, that was more valuable than some certificate and certain individuals accumulated a lot of those certificates and then after some time they turned out to be you know, majority controlling shareholders of major blue chip companies in the country. And we've seen it everywhere, right? Not just in Czechoslovakia at that time, also in Ukraine, also in the Soviet Union, also in, the, in, in Russia, also in the, in the number of countries in Southern Eastern Europe. That's why a lot of people think that Oh, maybe management buyout was better. Yes, we also have examples of um, um, CEOs who uh, reached out to their friendly um, loan officers from friendly financial institutions, give me a loan so that I can buy the ownership. But by doing so, it was a quasi-privatization because nothing really happened. There was no new fresh capital. There was no new know-how. Nothing changed on the supervisor board of those institutions. So by taking to all, all this into account, when I'm coming to the situation, and the most recent one being that um, Romgas, which really um, put Romania on the radar screen of a lot of investors, uh, when we went through um, hardships because we needed to translate into the local capital markets agency and then to the parliament what the GDR means because if you want to float a company and if you want to offer half a billion, it's just the local exchange with all due respect is not able to absorb all this, um, all your retail and your institutional investors, then we need to do a dual listing. We need to um, uh, create a momentum uh, for the pricing and that pricing will be driven not by the local market by, but by foreign investors. Foreign investors are not going to spend six months to establish an account on a Bucharest stock exchange. So you need to go. And I don't care whether at this point this is a dual listing in Frankfurt or Vienna or London, but the investors are not sitting in our region because only a few of them are in Warsaw because most of the privatizations happen them there and then they realize that mm, maybe it makes sense to actually have a direct access to the local stock exchange because there is a sustainable flow of, of, of new companies coming in. I think that one of you also mentioned that um, uh, what next, right? After the ta port of Tallinn and investors in the US asking, okay, so we're ready for the next opportunity. Um, uh, so we went through hardships, but the government very skillfully, and we borrowed the lessons of the Polish government said that it, we are not selling, what's the term, national silver um, to foreigners. We are empowering you, the electorate, for God's sake, the citizens of this country to be the co-owners of your blue chip companies, of the household names in this, in this country. And we did the way, I think that, um, Hannes, you, you put a slide with the PKOBP, the transaction on which I, I'm, I was um, uh, one of the lead managers at that point. We even utilized the post offices and the metro stations, right, in Warsaw to actually distribute the, the, the certificates. So there was a, a very kind of carefully planned campaign to the citizens with um, commercials right before and right, right after the evening news that we want to make you Poles the co-owners of your largest financial institution. And I think that was very telling and, and, and I think that it was not a gimmick. That was virtually what was happening. And also, I remember when the US investors were telling us that bring more, don't, don't be selfish, don't be afraid, allow for more companies to go to the stock exchange because you are fully in control of the process, right? You will still end up controlling those companies. Just offer initial several, 12, 17, 20%, right? What we see right now when you look at the largest blue chip companies from Eastern Europe, whether it's the Polish energy or banks, whether you look at mall, energy company from Hungary, or chess, energy company from, from the Czech Republic. In most of these cases, the government either still controls them and has the proverbial, you know, 50% plus one share, but in some extent, in, some, in certain cases, just a blocky minority stake of 25 plus one is sufficient. Um, so different motivations, but what I'm trying to say here, because you asked me the original question, and sorry for taking so much time. Um, I think that key takeaway would be that, call it privatization or, or, or invent a different word, this is allowing you to participate, to become an owner 
of, of some of the blue chip companies in your own country, and then following um, the, the language from EBRD, which I, uh, which I like, um, create the equity culture in the country. We are not earning anything these days on, by, by putting money into savings account in our banks. Doesn't matter these banks are here in, in, in London or, or in Asia, uh, which means that we also encourage um, citizens to think about some other ways of saving for future, right? And that could be investing in equities of their own companies that they know very well. Um, and I think that um, goes um, um, without saying that we also allow for local pension funds. I don't even know in the small countries like uh, Latvia, Lithuania, the Baltics, but also Czech Republic, Hungary, there is not much choice in what those, invest those pension funds can invest. They're probably overly invested in government bonds or some other OECD fixed income instruments. This guy knows very well. And, and he knows closely. very well because there is just not much liquidity on the local stock exchange, right? So we also help our own pension funds. So it works for us, for our future retirement payments. I stop here because I can go. That was good and a lot, yeah. Rafael, thank you, thank you for that. As you have this very, very bright and very long uh, knowledge and history and, and, and experience, so that's really, really. And I guess that's 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 you gave to the minister and other politicians. Hope I hope here in Latvia those selling points, yeah. That that let's say take care about your pension yourself, support your national champions, national companies, yeah. So government anyway control will control like uh, 51 or more. Uh, even with 25 point plus one uh, share, you can do a lot. And actually, I've asked Waldo, this, this 67 that was planned, or that was like by demand, supply, like analysis result? You like, that was that, a goal to, yeah. to, to sell 30, exactly. you know, 3 that, percent. Yeah. That was planned, but at the same time, they said that maybe in, in, in coming future, uh, they will sell more, but not they, they go below 51, that, that's what they stated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and still be strategic asset and government controls all most important decisions. Yeah, so uh, Petris, then to you. Uh, as I said, you are the biggest actually money manager here in Latvia and probably in the Baltics. Uh, what to do if there is no companies to invest? What is, let's say, some, let's say, some rational proportion, let's imagine that there are like 10 new IPOs in Latvia, it's, it's, it's wise to invest uh, very big money proportionally from your portfolios in one country, what are those risks and allocations and so on. What are? Because finally we see that uh, in, in last years, uh, altogether investments in, in Latvian economy of Latvian pension managers uh, has decreased significantly, six times from some 60% to some 10% today. Yeah, so no no instruments yeah i guess you all already answered the the worry that 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 uh, rafael raised that well we are over invested in local bonds etc that's not true we were invested like uh, in uh, like five years ago now those i guess latvians have become more like estonians in the sense that in estonia there has never really been a government bond market because well government has no debt uh, in here, well, partially thanks to central banks who, who are buying up everything, well, we're, we're investing uh, in different vehicles. And what to do when there's no local investment market? Well, in, in our case, in Sandbank's case, we've uh, gone the alternative route, meaning we're investing a lot and a lot of money into alternative investment funds, which is uh, Baltic real estate, Baltic private equity, and uh, if we compare the uh, amount that we've invested in Baltic stocks, then across second and third pillar in Latvia, those are 18, 19 million euros, one eight, one nine. But if we look at, uh, at, at uh, alternatives, then in alternative investment funds, it's over 100 million euros. So, and, and we've been working very, very carefully on selecting uh, the alternative managers and with, with our program of that's been running for five years well we managed to build up a very good um, 
good investment portfolio and still we're 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 a believer in, in that asset class so why is why is it so well because as everybody most likely knows there's no really an equity market in uh, in, in in Latvia and also for us the, the Baltic equity market is pretty small um, I, I guess I could I could add that spoon of uh, sugar in this water glass and it's gonna be okay but if I don't have a spoon if I have a bag of sugar and not the usual one kilo bag but the big 50 kilo bag and I'm gonna pour it in uh, nothing good is gonna happen the same is like with with local local stocks so uh, uh, we are when there are new local issuers coming onto the market we're looking at them and uh, basically if there's gonna be a supply and if the price is going to be good, because, for instance, we also looked at Citadel's IPO case, and well, we were we were willing to invest, but not at that price, at lower price. So, if the company has good pricing, if it has good corporate governance profile, and if it has a good sustainability and environmental prog uh, program, then yes, we're we're gonna invest and. and uh, I'm a believer in investing in local economy because, well, it it it, it then uh, comes back uh, through other channels to, to our, our pension savers, uh, not only through the returns that uh, these local investments generate, because they are illiquid, and usually in in, in financial markets, if something is illiquid, then uh, you can ask from the buyer's perspective, set a lower price for it, and thus earn more in the long term but also from uh, developing a local economy and, and creating new jobs and thus adding additional boost and benefit to the, to the locals. So if, let's say, and I understand you right, let's say if there in Baltics will be new, like serious and good companies uh, offered, sure, you have a lot of so-called dry powder to, to jump in and, and to participate. Of course, you said valuation and, and all this uh, and business model, transparency and, and so on. So you are ready to buy a lot if there is good supply. Yes, if there is a good supply, we're always glad at uh, looking at it. Yeah. So then, companies here, CEOs, board members, surprise board members, do you you hear it? Yeah. So there is a guy with money, and uh, and 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 that's easy in general. Yeah, just to decide. Um, yeah, because but I what like I comment on that. Uh, I guess before the financial crisis in 2008, 9, let's say the banks were so active that they they, they, they they were in all sectors, in, in senior debt and, and mezzanine debt, in, in some call, even in capital, by, by supplying uh, by or supplying uh, capital to the market. Right now we see different situation, and as we see the, the, the estimations and, 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 and prognosis for this year, at least in Latvia and altogether in Baltics, Personally, I do not see that banks are so keen to provide credit to the market. I think so. And, uh, and this is a good moment for, for other capital instruments to be used. Bonds, equities and so on. Because banks are very, let's say, conservative. Then go companies. Actually, this is the natural need because we can talk a lot, a lot that it is good to be in stock exchange and a lot of examples and so on. But the companies must decide why to be not because the minister wants to do that. Naturally, it would be the companies want to get, let's say, additional capital. They go to investors, and that's it in general. And and, and I hope that uh, on one hand, this situation with the banks will will improve. I I hope that this will help uh, for stock exchange to, to 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 get new customers. But coming back then to the biggest investor, the biggest supporter of of of, of this uh, uh, Baltic market, to Hannes and Eberd. Why are you actually doing so lot good things for here in, in Baltics? Why you are actually supporting and, and sponsoring some costs of listing yeah, for some companies? Yeah? Uh, why you are like supporting uh, bureaucrats with some kind of advice how to harmonize Baltic market, to harmonize legislation? Why you are doing this? I think that's an easy answer. It's because we are a development bank. so. <laughs> Uh, but I would like to, to come back as well to first thank you, Raphael, for the promotion. Uh, what is the difference of privatization we have seen before and now? 10 years and 15 years ago, the state didn't face so much commercial risk in the state on the enterprises. They were more or less 
egg working in, in one country, but through a deregulation... Like monopoly a little bit, yeah. yeah. Little bit, yeah. Through the deregulation, the commercial risk for the state increased. Good example, as mentioned before, on the airline industry. Shrinking margin in some cases, and you have only few which are really standing out, which would be good IPO candidates. Energy sector, we see much more competition in the energy sector than we have seen 15 years ago. That means if a company is privatized, the chance that it becomes a private monopoly is less than it was 15 years ago. So it's really a, a changing environment, and the same is true in the transport sector as, as well. And now the question is, what risk is the government willing to take? What risk it would rather prefer to outsource it by still be having a controlling stake into it? And that, I think, is a, has to be a very careful planned exercise. I think it's a very good initiative to centralize the state holdings within an agency to have a very strategic approach in this regard. And that was our experience during the last 25 years as well in the various countries we have been active. We have seen that the proper developed privatization strategy is very much depending, do you have one champion in the country which coordinates the efforts and comes up with a clear proposal in this regard? Why we are supporting capital market development in the various countries and specifically in the Baltics is on one hand, I think you have currently a set of governments which are willing to use the window of opportunity to diversify the financing sources for the local industry. That is one thing. The second thing is research has proven that a country which has a well-developed banking sector and a well-developed capital market grew much faster than the ones which only had a very well-developed banking sector. And I think that was forgotten for a couple of years. That was one of the reasons why the US recovered after the financial collapse quite quickly compared to continental Europe, where it took much longer than in others. So it has to be a balance between financing through the banking sector and financing through the equity market, which is what you learn in the first lesson when you're attending a business school and signing up to corporate finance, that you have to look for the optimal capital mix. And it's not only loans, it's a mixture of equity and debt capital, which you have to look forward. And what we also see is that the investor decision base is changing. It's changing from stock picking and active investment, more or less to the passive investment style, so following indices. Smaller countries normally don't uh, are not considered, but I don't want to repeat what, uh, what I said before. And our experience in the various privatizations where we were participating, I was pre-IPO pre investor, IPO investor, or providing loans for the restructuring, we are quite positive, I must say. And what we have developed is more or less an institutional memory. So we research really what were the key success factors, why does a, did a specific investment case not came through? Also, we had our bad experiences, but the, predominantly it was very positive experiences. And what I think is a key, key success factor is first, government commitment, a clear plan, and then selection of a companies which really qualify for something like a listing on a stock exchange. Not every company fits to a capital market environment. It may have more social impact by still being in the state hands. And I think here, we as bank, what we can offer is to share our experience and to provide support as far as possible. May it be from the advisory side or even more from the investment side, if it's the right investment case, of course. And to give you an example, we have invested since 1991, 2.2 billion in the Baltics, and we are off 700 million in Latvia. So as I understand, for example, if our Baltic will be for sale in stock exchange, your bank, you, you can participate as you participated. In, uh, I, in I, did, I didn't see that. What I said is we will analyze the business case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Rafael, please. Yeah. No more propaganda about EBRD, but I do have to say being on the other side and representing the companies and interacting with investors, there is a clear expectations to have specifically EBRD because, because of their commitment to the region, not so much um, certain other IFIs which are also present in our region. But there is an expectation because uh, not so much in the more developed um, 
uh, politically stable uh, Baltic states, but in certain other countries in our region, uh, it's good to have an IFI, which at the end of the day, apart from being owned by the US and Korean and Japanese and now Chinese, but also Western European governments, also you've got all the local governments represented in the shareholder, in the ownership of, of EBRD. So it's a good buffer for a lot of investors sitting somewhere in Boston or in Manhattan, thinking about investing specifically in Southern Eastern Europe, that I'm gonna have somebody who is sitting with me on the supervisor board. If something goes wrong, I can, I, can, I can use, so to speak, EBRD to appeal directly to the government. Um, so we want EBRD to stay here. We don't want the Baltic states to graduate um, um, like certain other countries have, including Slovenia, and then EBRD came back um, uh, because you bring a lot of good things. And as I said, there is an expectation um, among the investor, um, in, in the investor community. There was a question earlier about the ratings, and uh, um, I don't remember somebody sitting behind me asked the question on the, it's not required, but it's very much, by the way, connected with EBRD. Um, this is very important for the credit story. Um, uh, that uh, the company uh, is in the process of, of uh, obtaining a rating. Um, uh, it also depends on the rating of the sovereign. Um, so it depends um, uh, what is the rating of the, of the outstanding bonds of the Ministry of Finance in the country. But in all these processes, and that's usually the, especially in Eastern Europe, I noticed, companies first, they graduate from just being dependent on the local financial institutions, meaning in our case, in our region, the usual suspects, Western European banks, because they own our banking sectors. Um, then they graduate to bonds locally, uh, listed, issued, or in international markets. Uh, that is connected with obtaining ratings, and I think that the, the, the person who asked the question also added, it's a fantastic homework for the management to go through the process to face the rating agencies, because they are behaving like investors, right? And they ask all the tricky questions before you go um, and, you, and you consider um, an IPO. In all these processes, EBRD is superbly helpful, and they've got all these different technical assistance programs, uh, which are for free for issuers. So uh, you can utilize them and do the environmental analysis or utilize their help with the restructuring of the, of the, of the board, um, and that's free for companies. Um, and, and I think that EBRD should be doing more of kind of marketing, that this is the kind of value added for them. Um, and, uh, but there is a lot of companies, obviously, who have gone through the process and who can um, testify to this. Um, one other aspect that came up as well, by IPOing SOEs, by creating this equity culture, you also encourage privately managed companies. Look at Poland, it's very aspirational for a lot of entrepreneurs who are millennials and young Gen X um, entrepreneurs. They are in their mid 40s. They don't want to sell completely their companies to foreigners. The, so, the, so that um, IPO route is a very kind of um, uh, clever solution for them uh, to partially divest, enjoy the proceeds for the first time in their life, but then stay and manage and still control the, those companies. So this is one of the kind of spillover effects uh, when we IPO the big SOEs um, on the local exchanges. Yeah, we have some hopes, and, and, and as far as I know from companies in Latvia, that are those young entrepreneurs and, 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 and modern thinking people. Yeah, that's, that's sure. Okay, we have talked a lot here, but you have listened, I think, very well. And I think that you have maybe some questions. We can talk and talk. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my name is Justinas from, from NASDAQ Vilnius. Uh, thanks thanks for, for interesting views. Uh, just a couple of words uh, about the Lithuanian market. So on Lithuanian market, we currently have five listed SOEs, uh, but on the other hand, we have a slightly different problem there. Uh, too, too little of, of their free float is available from two to three percent. Only one of those companies, Klipados Naftau, Klipados Oil, has from 17 uh, to 30 percent of free float, depending on how you count. And actually, this company busts a bit this geopolitical risks myth. Uh, so as we know, so it's currently uh, 
uh, SOE, which has the highest free float on, on NASDAQ Vilnius, but it didn't prevent, for example, to, to build uh, an LNG oil terminal, independence terminal, because there is some fear among the politicians in the current geopolitical environment that, you know, if an SOE does, does an IPO, there, there can be, you know, some unfriendly investors that, that can preclude, you know, a strategic project. So Klippedos Nocta busts that myth. Uh, but maybe on the question side, definitely, we, we heard like 100, 100 reasons, uh, you know, for an SOE to do an IPO, and it seems pretty straightforward uh, story, but maybe to, to pick up uh, a bit on, on last Haynes' thought, you know, also, you know, our politicians are discussing, you know, perhaps that some SOEs, you know, have predominantly public functions uh, or 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 that, you know, they should continue some, you know, unprofitable, unprofitable public functions like railways, you know, doing, uh, continuing some routes, some unprofitable routes, or that, you know, electricity prices should not be commercially based to, be, to, to keep the consumers happy. So uh, maybe, uh, Haynes, uh, starting you, maybe you could elaborate a bit, you know, what are the main qualifications uh, where you would see a business case for, for an SOE uh, to really opt opt for the for the IPO route and whether you know some sectors and some SOEs are more natural candidates uh, in your opinion than others. Uh, I, I brought a very good example today in the morning where or in the afternoon, sorry, where the Fra French government decided to privatize the airport in Paris, which is really a step which was from nobody expected because it creates revenues. It, it's one of the most prominent airports in continental Europe. But at the same time, the reasoning given by the government was very plausible. They were saying, okay, we know that's a traditional asset. It faces a lot of competition and at the same time, we have to secure the future tax income for the country, and we will use the proceeds of a privatization to put it in an innovation fund to promote artificial in intelligence, robotics, and other innovative technologies in France to get uh, companies into it. Uh, we have currently the pleasure of working with uh, uh, Latvian ministers in due course on SOEs uh, with help of the European Commission Structural Reform Service Program, which will have a closer look what are the op options for various state-owned enterprises and what is the opinion of the government to going forward. I think it's a little bit too early now to differentiate uh, from the company side, but I think that is a very welcome next step to have a very strategic approach how to handle state-owned enterprises and which one may be uh, put forward for IPO privatization, maybe for a strategic sale, or should stay in the hands of a government. And I, I mentioned something before which is very important. Time is more important than money. It has to be planned very well. It may take a little bit longer, but the outcome may be much better than to rush forward and have a failed IPO, and everybody will be disappointed. So I think that's, that's very important to keep in mind. I think there is a large appetite for state-owned enterprises nowadays, even in a competitive environment. Port of Tallinn is a very good example for it in the region. And I think various governments will follow the same route. And nobody would have expected under the current circumstances an IPO in, in France. So I, I think that is a step-by-step -step approach. Analyze, define the strategy, and decide which assets and which one you would like to keep. Am I uh, still a blocking minority or a blocking majority? Whatever it will be. Which is selected, SOE selected for privatization, for flotation, for listing. It doesn't have to be a star performer. There's a lot of um, pension funds uh, which are looking for dividend yield. They're looking for sustainable flow of dividends. The business doesn't need to be exciting at all. Thames Water, the water utility in London, 
is owned by Canadians and Kuwaitis. It was owned by Australians before. Electricity in London is provided by a French company. Heathrow is owned by Spaniards. Half of British Airways is, is owned by, um, by Spaniards. Um, the com and airline is a utility for me. Banks these days, we just mentioned, they're overly regulated. They're utilities. They're no longer banks, banks delivering ROEs of 20 plus percent, right? They're overly regulated. That's why they're so careful and conservative. Um, uh, but just to give an example, in uh, the, the, the key point is that we don't have to look for the star performance in our economy. And uh, the last point, because the innovation fund, I think what the, and I don't want to um, overly advertise what the Polish government did, but um, what was behind collecting partially some of the proceeds for privatization and establishing that PFR entity, like a little sovereign wealth fund of, 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 of the uh, Republic of Poland, was that for the time for after when a lot more Eastern European countries like Ukraine, maybe Turkey in the future will become the members of the European Union. Poland will not be receiving so much subsidies from Brussels as it benefits now. So for the future, we need to establish some kind of fund uh, which will help us to uh, provide dividends for future generations. We don't have natural resources, so we cannot establish um, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, right? But we more can follow the kind of Temasek model from Singapore without natural resources, but to find some other ways of generating the inflow of funds for future generations. And by the way, the last point, Sovereign Wealth Funds are probably the best managed SOEs. Can I add something uh, in addition that I wanted to, to, to just add that, uh, well, the product doesn't have to be exciting to, to, to make an IPO. And uh, actually, the good company it doesn't mean good investment. So it, good, good investments are defined by, by other criteria. So if the company has sexy product, doesn't mean that it's going to be a great investment. Good afternoon. I have a I have a question. My name is Dins. I work in healthcare sector. Uh, in uh, in Europe, probably especially in Europe, healthcare sector is not sort of the uh, natural target for uh, privatization. And uh, more specifically, if we would look at uh, tertiary level or university hospital sector. Uh, nevertheless, the uh, respectful um, panel uh, in front, probably you have any experience in our part of the world or reflections. Uh, since there are a number of, of, of problems we experience here and probably some other countries as well. First is balance care for the patients and financial sustainability. Also, if you look at healthcare, the planning should be long term because of different reasons. Uh, however, the uh, changes in political world means that that planning is fairly difficult. Uh, so my question uh, would be, do you have any um, reflections, ideas? Would that be also a potential target? in certain uh, circumstances for uh, privatization, at least partly. Sort of the tertiary level hospitals, specifically. We were allowed to ask any question, I understand. Yes. Yeah, sure. We, we obviously are not experts, but this is probably one of those specific sectors uh, where you need to think twice what to do. I think that um, it is, and I strongly believe, always a good idea to go to the stock exchange just to have that optionality for additional source of funding so you not only rely on the local markets and on the local financial institutions and to float a minority stake, okay? Um, but you are talking about the very kind of specific sector. We obviously are more familiar with the generics and the usual pharma companies being the Kirkas of the world from Slovenia, or the Polish companies, or Gedon Richter, et cetera, from Hungary. So these are the kind of more straightforward 
models um, where people understand. I was always told by my healthcare um, specialists that healthcare specialists are sitting in Japan and California. Nobody else understands healthcare, maybe parts of France and Switzerland. But, but this is a very specific. Um, I was a part of the project a few years ago about utilizing um, real estate on the border between former Yugoslavia and Austria and to redevelop those um, um, big um, uh, um, socialist resorts when people used to go turnus after turnus uh, and um, uh, to, to redevelop them with certain um, pension funds and healthcare companies from Germany so that to open them up for future retirees from Austria for Germany, but also from Eastern European markets. So this could be something similar because I think that we are experimenting with these models now on the Baltic Sea, right? We don't offer them the, the, the weather, but we offer the long walks on the beach along the Baltic Sea and you can breathe in your yacht with your dog and that's, and that's very good and all the medical treatments. So, so we do that and there is a number of companies um, in Poland that probably offer good examples of developing that model so that you don't have to reinvent it from, from scratch. But I just volunteered off the top of my head. Um, very difficult without knowing the specifics. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, the thoughts that were going through my mind and why, uh, why the question uh, listening to the debate was uh, a number of, of, of things in, that, uh, in the balance. One is sort of serving the local people, then there is the open healthcare border and how to encourage that. Then there are incentives work in the public sector or work in the private sector and uh, how to keep the workforce. Also, how to ensure strategic planning and, as I already told, not be so very uh, dependent on, uh, on certain political change and so on. So, thank you. Well, for me, this all sounds more like a PPP, non-listed project. Um, would we be willing to invest in it? Uh, not sure. Uh, because, well, EBRD maybe. <laughs> uh, because, well, then also the, the, the usual questions arise, well, what, what, what happens if the, the hospital does not pay to investors? Well, how we deal with it? Do we, like, close? And then you have like headlines in media, like Latvian pension funds closing that hospital or kicking out those doctors or whatever doing. Um, it's a kind of very tricky situation. I can add, uh, so I can add from uh, M&A perspective uh, that uh, healthcare is a uh, very demanded uh, industry. Uh, from from private equity funds, sure. And if you looked at the transactions here in the Baltics, they are, in general, I think because of very poor development of state-owned hospitals and system in general, you know, private uh, hospitals are doing excellent. They are of course niche players and, and uh, uh, different models, but but they are bringing excellent uh, returns to the investors, and this is driver behind. Of course, there is a question in general state state state's money goes to state-owned hospitals. Partially right now, the state-owned money in Latvia goes as well to private hospitals and private players, but there is a perception that it might change in the future, that finally state will subsidize state-owned uh, entities, not private. But that's, I don't know, that's, that, that's a discussion. That's my point on that. Hi, uh, Vladimir Login, of, head of privatization agency. Uh, so first, a proposal. I guess what uh, we would appreciate EBRD and maybe also RAIN is you could uh, play a big role in actually persuading the government to diversify from the SOEs. It's quite difficult to get off the uh, dividend flow that actually is improving the budget deficit and you can spend it. Uh, by investing into something uh, which will not generate cash flow maybe initially, like the French idea. I think something of that aspiration is needed uh, to make sure that there is an appetite to offload some of at least minority stakes in the SOEs. Otherwise, it's quite difficult to get off that, uh, off that bus, so to say. And then uh, more of a question and invitation. So if you have any other word for that P word, we would appreciate that. We're changing the name this year, probably. So, any ideas are welcome. Maybe in Estonian language, that will be uh, maybe <laughs> would be quite difficult for us to pronounce it. 
like for example IPO agency um, yeah that was more like remark so some to rhetoric uh, question uh, some questions more please this is unique opportunity those guys came for you especially mm -hmm. if not yet then later with coffee and with some meal so thank you to everybody thank you for you all that you came to Riga thank you for all that you have done and you will do here hopefully a lot Paldies visiem. Tad pie darba.